okay about the companies coming in there buying up a lot of companies like the Dirks and the McGowan's and I don't know how many others and you, you see it happening and, and there you were uh, sitting on all this land and what did you think about that? Well we, we've had many many companies come by to see us and try to approach us on either buying or joint ventures or merging and different ways and we have not encouraged any of them as yet we're very familiar and that's one thing that I enjoy doing is reading about other companies and I've had a uh, very uh, good life of knowing a lot of these people I knew Devere Dirks very well I knew him uh, he and I were working together with Southern Pine Association when he died and he was really trying to hold his company together and then as soon as he died that was it and where I was stepped in and bought it I, uh, we knew the McGowans, all of them. We know some of the uh, Moltis, children. Moltis in Philadelphia. Yes, sir. And, and Tom DeWeese knew them. And uh, uh, most of these companies that knew the Withered Walker crowd that sold out to Whittle Lamont. And, and uh, I was sitting right working with the Southern Pine Association as a... As a officer, a lumber among, and tied in with it when, when the West Coast people started coming in the South and talking about buying this land and I saw the family organizations uh, sell out and merge and take stock and all of that so I've, 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 I've enjoyed a uh, 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 what would you say a, uh, a period of time that all of that's come about I remember going to the uh, to the Great Southern Lumber Company and I remember when they started planting over that way and then the T.R. Miller Mill Company we're very familiar with and the Dixons over in Alabama uh, the Fredenberg crowd uh, the Harrigans of Scotch Lumber Company uh, Perpetual Forest here in Florida and all the turpentine people who own land and about every one of the turpentine people that we knew that owned in the land uh, as soon as the prices picked up a little bit, they they sold out. So I've I've been exposed to all of that. You were going to tell me the story about the uh, companies, the turpentine company selling out, uh, <coughs> and then we got on other things. So this might be a good time to finish that story. Uh, <clears throat> just about all the turpentine people who coming along, the family did not did not necessarily follow them in the turpentine. It was a unique sort of business, and most of the families. Uh, wanted a better life maybe for their family and they uh, studied other things and uh, uh, got in other lines of business so when if any of them had any land they when the opportunity to put in paper mills gave them the opportunity of getting uh, ten dollars fifteen dollars an acre for the land they sold out and took that money and then they pretty well retired only a very few kept any land now the operators that were leasing land it sort of deteriorated that you couldn't lease it the paper mills were in there and all and you just couldn't lease it for what we had been leasing it for so they deteriorated so between that and the labor was harder to get from the walls on and then you had the uh, Vietnam wars and you had the Korean war and all of that it, was, it, it made the labor difficult to get so, so most people and this timber business has revolved around to get rid of it. Now you're seeing doctors and lawyers and other people look at some of this farmland that they can plant trees on and they're going to grow and get a return. And maybe it's coming back around to that to some extent. But all, that about all the families that I was in contact with and worked with in the Southern Pine Association, Forest Farmers Association, American Turpentine Farmers Association, or any of them have, have pretty well sold out. We have uh, gradually gotten our land base up, and I don't know what John Debbie told you, but we have 207,000 acres that we are trying to, to grow the maximum amount of timber on. Uh, well, your grandfather, your father, your generation, and Johnny and Robert, and they have children coming along. Well, you're, you're looking at it as maintaining the family. I'm mean, trying to. That's been my hope all the time, to keep this as a family-controlled company. Now, whether we can or not under tax laws and everything, I don't know. But we have done everything that we could, uh, hopefully, and we are looking at that from a standpoint of 
of being a land-based company and going that route. Now, as far as the operating companies, which uh, I'm sure John told you about Langdale Industries, which is more or less an operating company. Very little. I want to talk more about the companies. And uh, now that might be possible that we ought to be, uh, uh, if not a public, uh, to some extent, corporation, it maybe we ought to go more to an ESOP or something that way to bring in our managers so that they would participate in any profit. That we'd have in the operating company, but the land managed land companies, I would like to see go ahead and the family uh, uh, control that right on and on. That's been our, my desire, and I think that would be John's too. Well, I'm impressed. I, this this office was built in 1946. This office was built in 1951. We moved here. Uh, most companies would have a. A new office by now. Yes. Yeah, but you're satisfied, and it's a beautiful room you're in, and all the rest. But you don't have that. Well, image like well, George Pacific builds a 50-story building in Atlanta. This is what companies do. You see, but you haven't felt that need to. Well, we've been buying land and uh, putting and taking all our money, and we have lived conservatively, and our families live conservatively, and we haven't spent money. I always thought it was sort of a waste to have too big an office. And, and we made money in our manufacturing plants and in our forest operations, and we just haven't done it. Uh, we, we probably need, now we've got, you have, I don't know whether you've been to our other offices here. No, I haven't. We got, well, this uh, really is it's built later than this one, and you'll have to go in there while you're here. It's a uh, it's, uh, well operating business, but it's not elaborate. We haven't really uh, stood out here that we, we uh, had money to spend, and we, we uh, I guess that uh, I grew up at a time that we had several families uh, here in Valdosta who had made money in cotton, they made money in lumber, they made money in naval stores, they made money in banking maybe, and uh, most of them had spent it or lost it, in the, and uh, my thinking was that let's don't get out here and start uh, waving flags and spending money and all that. We want to be here known as conservationists, original environmentalists, and trying to improve our land and trying to furnish good employment. And I get great pleasure out of some of the uh, employees we got here, uh, black families that I've known them and I knew their family, and they tell me, says, well, a lot of people have told me I could get more money if I did this or that, and says, uh, Mr. Harley says, I've been out here for so many years and said I've raised seven children and said I haven't missed a single payroll and we have never shut down we just keep operating that might not be the best business practice but uh, we uh, we might slow down a little but we keep operating and we're, we're pretty steady employers are there state is there a state forest practice that I mean does the state regulate the way you reforest or not or? no sir no sir uh we have no regulation about that now. So if you burn slash, what, what you do is a decision you make as a land manager. There's no requirement to do something. Yes, we make it as a land manager. We've had uh, management plans, and we try to grow the maximum amount of timber, and then we try to grow timber that, uh, that'll go into lumber and poles rather than just on a pulpwood rotation. We do, not, uh, we do not prepare the site and plant uh, our land unnecessarily. We, uh, we'd rather not do that. We'd rather get natural reproduction. But we've got some land where we had long leaf that you can't get natural reproduction. And we've taken some of our sites, our long leaf sites, and we've clear cut that and spent money on the site and planted slash and planted some loblaw, improved seedlings. And that's been well. And we're growing, uh, I feel like that in many instances we've got We've got land that is a, a, a better site, that we're growing a cord, a better per acre per year. In fact, I know that we've got some that was, a, at one time or other, could have been in farmland that we're growing two cords per acre per year. But I'd say generally speaking, all our land, we're not doing that well. So, but we, uh, we can uh, we notify our Georgia Forest Commission, and you know, Georgia's been a leader they are a leader in statewide fire protection 
and that was the that was the problem when I got out of school. We did not have any fire protection except what we did with a pine top or with a shovel or with a, one of these flats, and then we'd have a few of us had those five gallon back pumps, and uh, we. Uh, <clears throat> We, we, we had to get have fire protection. So we formed TPOs, and the government uh, worked with us on that, and we got a reimbursement of about a third of the money we spent. And we would take in our neighbors, and uh, we, that enabled us to get uh, tractors. And uh, we, we uh, you know, they, this Mathis Pile was developed right down here at Lake City. And Did, did you say GPO? George? What, Timber, TPO. CPO. TPO, Timber Protective Organization. Okay. And uh, so that that was a big help. And uh, then I worked with some insurance company to see if you could get money, and we uh, we we were approved as uh, foresters that would appraise the land for them, and they would go ahead and loan fifty percent of what we said it was worth. And that was a big help until the paper, until the banks got in the loaning money and all that, so it was the credits better. And then I guess markets. I, I think here in Valdosta, in this area, that we have got markets now for nearly about all our species of trees and any size. I'm proud of the fact that uh, we've got good fire, fire protection and good markets. And I, I relate that to what I saw in Germany, that I think we're practicing good forestry here. And I think we are furnishing employment for a lot of people, both in the woods and in the plants. I, I want to say that the income from this area and this county, 50% of it, it comes from forest, land, and the, and, and the, and the eventual manufacturing of that product. Uh, so I, I, uh, I think that we've made a lot of progress, and I think it's going to even be better in the future. When, when you stopped down the naval storage business, you no longer have the trees with the scars on them. Is fire protection less important now than it was? The trees are less flammable. Well, that, that's right. It's less flammable. And I guess it was very, very important to have some fire protection then. But see, we, we'd weed around the tree and we'd have more control burning. And we had people who were experts at that. And people that didn't mind getting out there and doing it and starting the afternoon and let it burn till 12 o'clock at night. Now... You don't have those people. You've got to pay them by the hour, and they are not that dedicated to something. And it's more difficult. It's more expensive to have a control burning. And we're doing less and less control prescribed burning. And and, and so we're building up some of these uh, uh, builds up of a fuel that uh, we could have a uh, catastrophe, like we did in 1955 when the, when. 90,000 acres burned in one fire down here on Superior Pine Palace Company's land, little of ours, but most of theirs. Uh, so, uh, when you it, say it, uh, it's a fire now, it's intense enough to kill the trees? Kill the trees, and they harvested what they could, and uh, and then they had to reseed it and replant it. What's the rotation for these piling I see out here? What hull? Oh, we uh, we like to say that we're on a 30, 35 year rotation, where the paper mill tell you they are probably on a 23 year rotation. And the way we do that uh, is to, we uh, we plant our trees uh, in 12 foot rows. And by the way, I didn't say that we, 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 uh, we don't plant unless it's absolutely necessary, but we've got 80,000 acres of planted forest that we thought was not growing what we're doing and we didn't think of the possibility of natural regeneration. The rest of the land, which would be 127,000 acres, is we think that we're pretty well stabilized on natural uh, reproduction. Uh, so we, what we do is uh, we go in and thin our trees as quick as we can get put wood or fence posts out of it. After we thin it the first time, we do the do it again, and, and we we thin it a little lighter than most paper mills would. Then we go in and we thin it again in six or seven years, and uh, we probably have three thinnings that we won't get much out of except put wood and fence posts and maybe a few small logs, chipping saw we would call. Then the next time will be chipping saw and poles. And also, we go over the same track of land, maybe until we get our crop trees at 35 years old, maybe five times. We're able to do that around here. Our road system is good. Our, 
uh, and our trucks we can do that with and our, our mechanized mechanical equipment is so much better than what it used to be. Are you uh, waiting with uh, expectations or, or concern about the Bush administration making this determination on the definition of weapons? Well, uh, what I read about it is I sure am. I, I'm, I'm dis- I've been disturbed about it because, you know, not about every county has got somebody in it now that's uh, with a uh, ASCS office will tell you whether it's wetlands or not, and I don't think that they uh, they look at a, a aerial photograph and tell you whether it's wetlands or not. And uh, we uh, we're certainly not clearing up any wetlands. We do cut timber in wetlands, and we uh, we we uh, we've, we're so happy that we're getting started on some of these areas that we have not been able to cut anything on that so-called wetlands by cutting hardwoods and they're sprouting and we're planting some hardwoods now but we're also getting some lo- uh, loblolly pine and other uh, slash pine seed, seed that will fall in those areas and uh, yes we're worried about the definition of wetlands but now Bush in his last explanation of that and in, 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 in order that it came out was a, a little bit uh, not as uh, stringent as it was to begin with. And I think Bush is right about that. Uh, if I understand what he's saying right, there's so many of these things come out now, I, I don't I, I don't get to the final end of it. But, sure. uh, but uh, you know, <clears throat> we've got some wetlands here that's probably our best timber growing lands. Because a lot of our wetlands are wet only during January and February, or maybe a little bit in March. And if you do get wet in the later on in the summer, it won't last very long. With the, especially with the trees and practices and forestry like we try to do, it'll uh, use that water. Well, I haven't studied this, but I understand the uh, the problem for wetlands is that you, you can't change the species composition. Uh-huh. Is, is that I, the only restriction? I, I think that's right. I, as far as we know, we have not been we have not uh, had any problem. Yeah. But, now we do have a problem with these county places where they think that if you go in and cut timber, uh, that you might be going to take that into agriculture. Well, there's nothing could be further from my mind. Uh, we uh, we have, have stabilized pretty well between four and five thousand acres of cultivatable land. That's our best land, and we plant. Uh, we've got a big uh, tobacco lot. Tobacco carries our farming operation. We've got a, a peanut lot. Those two crops are. Uh, your cash crops. Cotton is sort of hit or miss. And then corn is uh, is difficult to make any money. Soybeans are difficult. Uh, oats and rye and wheat, we can't make any money. We make a little bit on cattle, not much. So, uh, but we're not we're not taking any land for agriculture. Should I talk to you about the agricultural land or should I talk to Billy about that? No. Oh, yeah, well, I'm, yes, I'm, the, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for the agricultural okay. land. I read somewhere that, that Billy's been very active in, in, in tobacco. Billy, he was uh, on the uh, a board of the uh, tobacco program in Durham uh, for uh, for a couple of years. But Billy has never been active really in the uh, farm and operation. Okay, let, let, we'll come back to agriculture then. Uh, so the only regulations really on land management are federal. Well, other than the county zoning ordinances for agricultural land or, 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 or the expansion of cities where you get to right. zoning for well, professional well, Now, land. when you say federal, you mean on federal land? Well, no, I'm in the wetlands. That's a federal. Oh, yeah, right, right. And, 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 and the pollution problems from your from your preservative, those are federal laws. Oh, yeah, right. The state is not involved. Well, the state, the state is in, environmentally. Uh, very strong. They work with the uh, general federal laws on that. So there are state laws yes, sir. that you comply with on, on land management? On, not on land management any more than uh, the tie in with the federal law on the agri- changing, agri- changing land to uh, for a different purpose. So uh, uh, we haven't had any trouble, you might say, from the state. But you don't have wilderness issues. You don't have rare and endangered species, or do you have rare and endangered species here? No. No. So it's wetlands and 
pollution. Right. Those are the that's right. the two issues you've got to deal with. And it's probably going to get worse rather than better. From right. Point of view. Right. Because it's hitting the, it's hitting the federal lands and state lands first, more so. And then where they've got this, uh, well, uh, well, oh, we do have where you're talking about the woodpeckers and all of that. Now, you're talking about Spotted Isle out west, but, you know, we're talking about the red-headed, pileated woodpeckers over at Thomasville and older-growth timber. But we haven't had that problem because we are, we're not growing older-growth timber. Now, you've got some plantations over there that just keep it and keep it and keep it. And that's the home of the red-headed, pileated woodpecker. So, how are you? Eighty years. When does the when does the tree become old enough? Though? Probably, probably seventy-five, eighty years. From a management point of view, does it make sense to you to keep timber that long? No, I I hear talk about one place over there that he uh, is uh, uh, he uh, and this is a fellow named Bicknell that uh, says that he's able to sell some of his logs that he has a special a small sawmill saw up some of that and it's just plain hardwood you know that somebody that he sells up the northeast that wants some of that that he gets a tremendous price out now he might have enough to do that but I wouldn't say that that's the way for us to go does Georgia have a yield tax or ad valorem what? well we just now we have ad valorem tax and we've just now passed this law that we're going to pay a tax on what we produce off the land we did have our ad valorem tax that we had to pay each year on the value of our land and the value of the timber on the land. Now it's changed and we have amendment number three and it's starting here in January that we're going to pay uh, so much for the timber that we sell and sell uh, from our land. And then we're going to pay on the la- on the b- basis of just the value of the land, not the timber, which we think is going to be better if we get all the details worked out. So that, that, that tax will... Your, your thinnings, your commercial thinnings will be taxed. Right. And the final, Anything that brings in money in, yeah. So this fellow that's holding this 80-year-old trees, he's going to be better off when it goes to a yield tax. Severance tax. Well, that's right. It, it would, would be if, he could, if he's got that market. Yeah. Uh, all right, that's right. Johnny, Johnny, who you've talked to, is keeping up with that with the uh, Georgia Forestry Association. The rest of us have spent our time with the Georgia Forest Association and forest farmers, and so he's, uh, he's, uh, that's his detail now. But you know, I, I told somebody, I said, I guess the things that worried me as, as much as anything through life is that taxes, taxes on land has been a problem ever since day one when they were 10 cents an acre, and it's just been creeping up all the time. Now our tax uh, taxes on up there just had the lowering taxes of three and a half and four dollars. Some of them even higher than that per acre. But as long as you got taxes, and then you uh, then the environmental laws that worried us, uh, and then of course your labor unions, which we really haven't had that much trouble with, but it's always uh, in the background. Sure. I don't know how to uh, talk about the various companies, it's Langdale Timber Company, Langdale Woodlands, J.W. Langdale, Langdale Industries, mm-hmm. and to me their names, to you, you, you know why they exist, why they're separate, why they're someone merged. I don't know. John talk, yesterday talked about, he, he helped with his law training, he helped bring all these companies together into a single company, and then, and then you spread out. Well, that's right. Uh, well, I, I guess the best way for me to explain that is to show you a little. I guess that's what we're looking for. Thank you. 
okay, it's, it's clear in your mind. We can always. Well, I've got it right here. Okay. This is a pencil copy, and I've got a much better one. I'll, I'll check and see if my secretary has come in. What we've done uh, is uh, the Langdale Company is the is the is the main corporation. That's who our tax return goes in. The Langdale Company. The Langdale Company owns Langdale Industries, and Langdale Industries, uh, I guess that's something better than this for him to give you that straight, but I'll get, I'll, I need to get that up for you. Let me see if she's come yet. Okay. Let's get your water fixed by now. Is there water fixed by now? I hope so. Yeah. Faye, uh, did Carol ever come in? All right, let me know when she comes in. Thank you. I'll get you a copy of this, but I can just tell you generally now that we've got uh, we've got these other corporations that Langdale Industries, and see we've got uh, Jim Restis is uh, president of the Langdale Industries, and Johnny Langdale is president of the Langdale Company, and uh, the reason that we've got these is that we've got profit sharing with all of our people pretty well, mm -hmm. except those that might belong to the union. If we have one organization that's in the union, we, it's a, we've got a, a pension plan and we are not in the profit sharing business for that. We, uh, we've got, the, uh, we've got uh, several corporations like Langdale Tire Company or Industrial Saw Works. It just sort of started up because uh, we had to sharpen our saws. We wanted the best equipment we could, money could buy and we wanted the best people. And when we did that, somebody wanted us to do theirs for them and the next thing you knew, we uh, was staying uh, 50 percent with outside and 50 percent with us, and now it's about 75 outside and 25 with us, and we've got a plant up towards Atlanta and one here, and so uh, they all, uh, if they make a profit, they share in the profit, and we go from that standpoint. We've got green leaf wood products, which is wholesale. We're buying and selling, and then we've got the Langdale Forest products, which are sawmills and the treating plants. And then we've got Langboard, which I want you to see while you're here, over in Butts County, where we're making OSB. We were the first company in the southeast, first one in Georgia. And then we've got Southern Remanufacturing. We call it Southern Reman. And we take our lower-grade lumber, and we cut out the defects, and we make other things out of it, and we do specialized sawing. And that doesn't need to be under the overall company, you know, and that we have that uh, separate. Uh, then we've got... Uh, Southland Forest Products, where we are dealing with <coughs> with uh, individual pulpwood producers, loggers, and all of that, which is a little bit better from a liability standpoint. And we we carry uh, 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 we make all our producers have workman compensation, but we are self insurers here in our main company, you know. But we can work those things a little better that way. Nineteen Fuel Company, we we got uh, we sell uh, propane gas and. All specialized oils and some gasoline that works out pretty good. Now, separate from all of this, we've got J.W. Langdale Company, which was a part that we had down there below Fargo that my grandfather had. Didn't have much land, but uh, that was a separate company. That was uh, we've had that all the time. Then we got another company right with it, which is totals of about thirty thousand acres of those Langdale Woodlands Incorporated. Then we've got Langdale Timber Company, and I'll show you how we do that. And then we've got my father left some of the land that he owned. He did not own much land in Langdale, uh, much uh, stock in Langdale Company. We worked all that around. And we've got H. Langdale Trust B, which is uh, distributed not to his children, except I share in it, and then they are his grandchildren. And then we've got the Langdale Foundation, and then we've got Langdale Ford Company, and we have uh, Southern Wheels, which is some of our truckers. We thought that that would be better separated. 
And then we uh, got Langdale Foreign Sales, which is, we have a tax advantage by doing it that way. So that's really the way we did, did some of that. But we got, uh, <coughs> yeah. I don't know what you want. This is a, this is a, a map, or just a general control map of our land. And you see, here we are here in Valdosta. Right here is our plant site. And all our lands around here, most of all of us within 50 miles except that piece of 5,000 acres over in Glen County just before you get to uh, uh, Jekyll Island, which we bought. And you see our land, the yellow is the Langdale Company. And then I own some, uh, no, this is H. Langdale Senior Blue. That This is the, the H. Langdale Trust B uh, Trust. And then you've got some lease land that we've got a we have 35 year lease along on. And then you've got the J.D. Langdale Company, which is here. Uh, and then Langdale Woodlands is here. And then you've got a piece of two that I own. That has the Fargo over here. Is this here. Fargo here? Fargo is right here. Okay. This is going on down to Jacksonville. This is Florida land. Oh, this is the Florida land right here. Why haven't you expanded more into Florida? It's well, the same we just, we just, uh, we had opportunity. Uh, we thought that uh, <clears throat> this is where the paper mill is down here, and uh, we maybe we should have, but that land was not as appealing to us, was not quite as productive. Really and truly, this is some of the more productive land, and this is some that we've had for a good while, and we, 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 we add. You see, we've got little holes here and there that we buy when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, but you'd, you'd be amazed at, now this piece right here, uh, we, I started buying that when I, I'd say I started buying that in 1938. And about 15 different people out to get it that solid all the way to the river. In there. Which so river is this? This is the Wisplacucci River. Coming all the way down, goes into the Swanee River, and goes into the Gulf. And this paper mill, is who, who has that mill? Well, right now, it belongs to PCA, Packaging Corporation of America, which is a Tenneco company. Okay. It was a national container of Jacksonville. What river is it based on? It's on the Withlacoochee River. It oh. comes on down here, and uh, it goes in. Let's see how that goes uh, I'm not... Chattahoochee River, I've heard of, but I haven't heard yes. of this. Which is well, the Withacoochee is not as big a river, but yeah. it comes in from, it makes up up in here, it comes on down this way right here. It, uh, uh, it comes on into the Withacoochee River just, it goes in there at right, uh, I, I bet you about 100 yards in Florida, and they, they regret that. They want to wish it had gone in with Georgia. Uh, the Florida is a, uh, raise the sand about that a little bit in there, you know, and it comes on down here. Uh, so the paper mill is on that way. We won't have any other paper mill in this area. The only other paper mill is down here in this part of Florida. Where was Stephen Foster? Here's the Swanee River. Well, the Swanee River yeah. would be, uh, be uh, I guess you'd call it down here. See, that's where 75 crosses going to Lake City. Uh -huh. This is going from Lake City on north. This map was, this part was some of this part was already in, but this is it. This is it. But where did Stephen Foster live when he wrote to all the Oh, songs? he lived in, uh, did he live in up northeast? No, no, he no. never did live down there. I don't think he ever saw the river. Okay. All right. There's yeah. a Stephen Foster Park over by right. Park. It's the White Springs. Yeah. Let's see. White Springs is right here. So Stephen uh, Park is uh, right here. Okay. The river. Jack, this way it's This way it's It's right down in here where the river comes on down here. Yeah. I see a, a Swanahoochee, the chief. This Swan is all Indian, right? This is Swanahoochee Creek. Swan that comes on down here and goes into Swan River. But so many of these streams end at Chi. Is that the Indian word for Indian river? Indian word. That, that's an Indian word. Okay. A Lapahal. We got a Lapahal River. 
that would come down, let's see, that would be right here. Alpha River comes on down and goes into the Swanee. And then we've got Swanee Creek and La Pucci and the uh, Whistler Coochie and the Willy Coochie up there. So you have a lot of those Indian names. Yeah, uh, where I'm from out west, there are a lot of Indian names, but none of them are, are like this. Uh, Different languages. We'll uh, get you a copy of our setup how we are. Good. All those different types of ownerships. I guess uh, having John in the company was very handy. There's a lot of legal questions setting up. John was a great blessing to me from the day he got back in from the wall. Of course, he practiced law, and he was busy some of the time, but then finally I talked him out of that and got my father down. My father came down here in 51, and when we moved down here, and uh, he, uh, he wasn't really interested in a lot of the things that we were doing, but he sure did like to be down here where things were going on, you know. And then John came down here later, and uh, I can attribute many of our trades to the fact that when things got hot and you could trade, I could take John and he and I could go and we could go ahead and trade. Now times, you know, you uh, you got to get a law firm and they're going to put you off and this and that. But it, John was a great blessing to me and this company. But it's... All these different companies are, it's a, this is an internal breakdown because you said the Langdale Company pays the taxes for everybody? Well, not necessarily pays the taxes, but the Langdale Company, they pay their, their pro rata share. Yeah. But the Langdale Company is a holding company of, of, of all the others, except now the ones I named that were separate. J.D. Langdale Company, Langdale Woodlands, Langdale Company. And yeah, they're separate for, for historic reasons. Well, uh, that's right. I guess it... Uh, that was done several years ago, and we just haven't changed them. And there's some merit in not having everything in one basket. Well, I'll be talking to uh, John Jay and Billy later in the week, so I'm not sure how that's what they're going to talk about that you haven't talked about. Uh, I want to discuss your agricultural lands. Is there more that we should talk about about the various companies you've listed them I mean, in terms of what you do you're, you're making oriented strand board now I mean, is this something we should get, get on the record is the actual manufacturing process as we've talked a little bit about poles and about naval stores but all, all the other th things you make today we haven't discussed is, would you like to go through the companies well I could I, I tell you I, I have a whole of thought has been uh, as I told you in the beginning, and when I got back in from school, we found out we didn't have fire protection. We, uh, you couldn't borrow money, uh, and you didn't have any markets. So I guess our whole theme of all this is how can we make our land more profitable? Sure. We were buying land. It took money. You borrowed money, and you, it's hard to pay back. And especially if you were in the hands of the factors, it was really hard to pay back. So what uh, I've been trying to do is to utilize our wood to the highest value possible. And so after naval stores being our main crop, we got into the pulp wood business by the fact that pulp mills moved south. And uh, we, we, I have great respect for any forester, any landowner trying to grow trees that didn't have a pulp wood market. But I don't know how you could really do it without it costing you a lot of money. So that helped our, helped our forest practices. It paid a lot of our expenses. And uh, some of this land that we bought, that we paid back over there, I remember that I would take $100 every Saturday morning up to the bank where he owed the bank money to, to pay for it that way. And uh, so I guess that our desire to improve our land, to grow more wood, to make it more profitable, to order to buy more land, uh, that we needed markets. So the first thing we did was, was we got in, we, we've been in the uh, lumber business on the Peckerwood deal. 
but but we uh, w that's all we could do on that. We didn't see Bill of the Big Bill at that time. So I guess the first thing that we did was a, a centralized naval stores plant. He owned this property. Uh -huh. And we had at one time 110,000 drums of rosin on this yard, more than anywhere else in the world. And that was a that was a that was a big operation, and it worked out fine because we could keep our records on a weekly basis of how much gum we produced and what our expenses were, and that helped us. Then the next thing we did was to put in the most modern wood pressure treatment plant that we could. We got an engineer from Pittsburgh who was uh, well known named Grant Shipley and built our plant here and got into the pressure treatment business. Starting off with poles, and then piling, and then lumber, and fence posts, and any any product that anybody wanted to treat it. So that was, uh, that was good, and that stood us well. Then after that, we, uh, we were still bringing in the lumber from the small sawmills and separating it on a lumber separator and then running it through the planter mill. Uh, and about that time, the, uh, the debarker was uh, becoming in use, and we started out, and we, uh, that was a great blessing to us. And that really uh, improved the marketing situation because uh, our chips... Uh, we sell now more than a thousand cards of chips a, a week, uh, and so you, you chip yourself. Now. Everyone goes to all our chips go to the PCA down here at Clarkville, eight miles from here. And I might uh, deviate right now and tell you that uh, we did business with the National Container Corporation. There was a paper mill built in Jacksonville in 1938. They converted an old fertilizer plant, a concrete fertilizer plant down in the river. And this uh, fellow's name was Sam Kipnis. He was a Russian Jew. He came to this country without anything, and he started making cardboard uh, boxes. How do you spell it? K-Y-K-I? K-I-P-N-I-S, Kipnis. Sam Kipnis. And... Uh, We started off trying to do business with him, and we found out that was impossible. But he got somebody to run his wood procurement department instead of him, and we got along with them, and we were shipping wood to them regularly and getting along fine with them. And Sam Kipnis got to be a good businessman and person after he made a little bit of money down there. And uh, I enjoyed doing business with him, and he and I became uh, uh, friends from the standpoint that he... Uh, he and I could do business without calling in all the lawyers and everything, and and, he, and we understood each other. In 1950, after the war, and I, that mill was built in 38, and then about 1950, 51, he started talking about another mill. He was really doing good. And so I told him that we would work with him, and we would furnish him his wood. He didn't have any money. And uh, so we got together, and uh, he, his crew came up here and they decided on this spot to have enough fall going down the river that they could have a, a ponding areas, and then that would aerate the water more, and that was the only place he could have it. And so we uh, guaranteed them that we would furnish them uh, so many cords of wood over, over 15 years. And then we would have the exclusive rights to the territory and work with him on Putwood uh, procurement. So we did that, and that caused me a lot of concern during wet weather. But if we didn't live up to that contract, they had a right to come on our land and get that much wood. But anyway, uh, he got his scribe in New York. That's where he started, Long Island. They came down in an airplane with about 15 financial people out of New York City. And we rode them around. Uh, they got here one morning and rode them around to, and had lunch in the woods. And every one of them said they saw more trees and seen all the rest of the life put together. <laughs> and they were dusty and dirty and we didn't have the paved roads in. And so he needed $25 million to build that mill, but he owed $6 million down here on the mill that he built because it didn't cost him that much to build it back in the 30s. So he borrowed $31 million and built this mill, and we had the contract with him for 15 years, and we then 
he sold out later to Owens, Illinois. And Owens, Illinois, and we worked together. And then Owens, Illinois sold out to this KKR crowd, you know, under the junk bond deal. And then they sold the uh, they sold the forest products into that to Great Northern Nakusa. Great Northern Nakusa was taken over by Georgia Pacific, and Georgia Pacific sold the uh, the Valosta Mill and this operation around here to. Uh, to uh, Tenneco, which is their, their subsidiary, Packaging Corporation of America. And that's what we got now. But all through these changes and all of that, we have Mr. Week of selling, selling them putwood and putwood chips. So that's been that's, that's been mutually advantageous. Uh, so I, I guess uh, uh, that's what's really added to us, that we work together and uh, it has helped us from a standpoint of, of, the, of the development of our forest practices around here as good. Uh, yes, we have a few uh, smaller landowners that have cut their trees and not do anything about it, but they don't really own the land very long. Somebody's going to buy it because you can't own land unless you, you are getting something out of it. And uh, you, you'll, see, you'll see very little land around here that's not either, either in the process of being reforested, uh, growing wood, or developing it for some sort of pur- purpose. And so uh, all of that uh, tied in to, to us going ahead, and then we said we're not using hardwood, and I would beg every paper mill hardwood. Brunswick would not come over this far and get it, and, and the mill at Jacksonville wasn't using it. A union camp was too far, and so we we uh, after reading about it, I guess from the time I was in forestry school until a few years ago, uh, we sat back when they when Southern Pine came into being a raw material for Southern Pine plywood, and we said our timber wouldn't fit that, but we had the timber that would fit the oriented strand board uh, business, and so we jumped on that and we built this plant over there, and we. Uh, and some improvements. I want you to see it. We're proud of the plant. We're making a superior quality, and we uh, we've been running good. The price has not been good because ever since we started operating, the housing starts have been down. We've been operating now. Let's see, uh, March 9th uh, next year will be four years. We've been operating. So we'll uh, I'll get uh, we'll see that you see that plant. So that ties in, and that gives me great satisfaction that we're taking these areas, and we're going to be able to use all the species and, and I have said for many years that oftentimes the best civil culture practices is uh, is utilization I, you have samples here of the strand board yeah. and it's I'm sure it's more complicated than it looks yeah. I, mean, I remember uh, Harry Merlo the Louisiana Pacific said half a dozen years ago that LP is going to put a major commitment into, into this they have to and about so there's a lot of competition a lot of folks are making this what what problems did you have getting started uh, did you use any kind of a tree no we we have not used the hard hardwood such as oak and hickory beech we had you were planting some hardwood somewhere now what's is that used for both was that used for this well for both we planted some hardwoods like a sawtooth oak tree for producer of acorns for deer management and uh, but but we are planting some yellow poplar. We planted some sweet gum. We planted some uh, uh, gums, and we find that some of our gums grow faster or faster than our pine trees. Uh, we're using all the gums: our sweet or red gum, our black gum, our tupelo gum, our water gum. We're using yellow poplar. We're using uh, we're using about any species that we grow down here except. Uh, uh, hickory and oak, and we think that, we, that there are plants that are using both hickory and oak. That's the wafer. Are there? There's five or six samples here, different sizes. One yeah. has some members on. Do you see something different in these? Did, to me, they look like all the same thing. Well, they are the same thing, the same mixing. And what we do is three layers. See, we uh-huh. put in one layer that's facing, say, east and west, one north and south, and then one another east and west. This looks a little bit different. Is that? Is that well, it's, a, it's the same thing, basically the same thing. But that's a, that's the one being commonly used right there for for subflooring and and uh, uh, 
sheathing and uh, for, for roofing. What's happened to the plywood industry then? This is it's slow it down. The price, the price on plywood, you know, uh, uh, is really, really different. I, uh, I was looking at it, yes, look at here. The price, here's the present price of OSB, which takes the price of plywood and has the price of plywood. You see, it's up here about 220 and this right here is up uh, about 135 137 I think, be exact. Say 140 so 140 to 220 is $80 a thousand square feet different. But this this is really the people that know anything about it, and we've got contractors now and architects that say this is better for what you use it for than plywood. Now I think the reason this is holding up is on account of the plywood mills that are shutting down on the West Coast, and, the, and we don't really have that many over here that are operating, you know. Yeah. Of course, plywood you can paint. So I mean, it has a smooth, smoother surface than this. So, well, now I think we're coming to that. We're going to have an overlayment. We're going to have a veneer. We're going to have paper. We're going to have a vinyl. I think we, I think that's our next step over there. I think the tongue and grooving is in, in order. I think the sanding is there, and I think you're going to be able to do most anything. The tongue and groove that would really. Uh make tighter joints and yeah well we can do that now uh, but we just got we can put that equipment in would you like a cup of coffee or something or? that might be a good time to take a little break here uh, I'm doing fine but well managed forest compared to one that's not managed are these the same tree 11 and 11 11 that, that, that's not the same tree okay but that's unmanaged and this is managed okay and look at this yeah. and look at this one right here uh, this one right here is older, older than uh, this one. This is something like 75, 80 years old. And see here, it's the same size as 11 years. So this grow that big is 16 years. I don't know. That's about 14 inches, or yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah, in, the, in the turpentine days, oh, that been great. Yeah. That that happens to be a lot, a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Now we can. You would you let it go? Yeah, let's go back and talk about your school days with Mark Worth as dean, because that's an interesting story. Well, I, I, I ought to have something here to show you. Well, I gave you uh, one of those, I think. Uh, while I was up there, we didn't have much of a building. Gordon Mar uh, Mark Worth set me up to it, and, and I was the uh, one that had the... Uh, Governor Rivers was uh, from right over here, 20 miles, and I happened to know him, and our families had known each other, and I went to see him, and they uh, they finally got the school from, from on account of that. But we uh, we uh, we had a good school. We didn't have many people there. Uh, but Gordon Markworth, I thought, was a mighty good dean, and I think he. So the opportunity, and at that time, you know, the the West Coast looked like that was a place to be to practice and sure. practice and forestry. And now it looks like all our West Coast friends, about in the 1960s, decided that down here was the place to come. Yeah. So things have changed. Well, this the change the situation in the old growth timber is going to have a big impact. Yeah. Uh, when I went to forestry school, we studied old growth forestry. Yeah. We 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 read about log rolling pine and all that stuff. Yeah. We, you know, we get out of school. I work for the Forest Service. And we I laid out clear cuts, 40 acre blocks, uh, high lead logging, and took out the old growth. But that's changing. Yes. So I think that I think the possibility of practice forestry down our area, where see, we're not we're not involved with any land that the Forest Service owns except this forest down here at Old Lusty called Osceola uh -huh. between Lake City and Jacksonville. We don't get any wood off of that. All of our wood is coming from private uh, industry. Now there is a 
U.S. forest down below Tallahassee, but we don't get anything over there. The Appalachian Coal Forest. So those are mainly uh, wildlife recreation. They're not used for timber production. Well, they are used for timber production, and, but they are tying in wildlife and recreation. That's another thing that we've done, uh, Doug Steen, over the years. Uh, we were always looking for some way to uh, increase our income from the land. And one way was to have cattle. And we had cattle on our land, and we worked that out, and it's got to be impossible to do that with those kind of cattle now, and with fences and the liability and hiring people to look after them and all. Uh, and you really got to burn your woods when you got cattle. But uh, we did that, but we came, we got the idea that we could lease our lands and, uh, and develop these recreational areas where they could hunt and they could fish. And that gives me great satisfaction to see the people, the people, the men and the wives and the children are out on it. We give them certain areas to camp in and then we lease it to them. And, and we've, uh, we've got something like 146 different leases on all our land. and they. They are great conservationists, and they are planting feed for game. And, and these they, are hunting clubs. Centers. Hunting clubs, and the groups of people. Some of them will be just two people, and some of them are 20 people, you know. But it's uh, working out good, and uh, I, I hope that develops because the deer population has really come back. Why, why is that? About On account of uh, got rid of the screw worms is the main reason. And uh, when he got rid of the screw worms, and my father was on the Fish and Game Commission at that time, and uh, they brought down the Wisconsin deer to South Georgia, Texas deer to North Georgia, and they put those out, and you know they protected them for a while, and it's unbelievable how they have expanded and grown and taken care of themselves. Did you have beaver this far south? Well, we sure do. I, have beaver. I live out west of town. We've got beaver there. we got a creek there that's dammed by beaver that... That it, uh, it's, it's a blessing if, if right now you know because we don't have any water, but most of the time it's a hindrance. Before we took a break for, for coffee, we were talking about Oregon and Strandboard. How, how how does a company like yours learn about new products? You're, you're involved in trade associations and magazines come in the mail, and, but how do you? decide let's look into this well first is we, we took a look at what we had and what we were going to grow and we says well now this is a product that we look like we're going to have the raw material in this area and we're going to have the raw material on our land and it's going to help us that way and then we do a lot of reading and we do a lot of talking and we talk to all these people and we uh we go one thing leads to another and that's the way i got into wood preserving business that's the way we got mowing the lumber business and talking to manufacturing and mowing the OSB business. Well, these are major or significant capital investments. Yes, sir. And, and so you have to demonstrate the, the viability of, I, I don't know, if you borrow money or if you have your own assets, but to build a strand board plant that's a major capital investment yes, and, and uh, you could invest to buy IBM stock instead. And you're, you're making a lot of decisions here. And yes. A lot, a lot of money is involved yes. in this. And, and you have enough the personnel, you can make your own decisions internally. Or you bring in consultants. no, we bring in consultants, and I, we've been trying to do something with these products all the time. And we would work with paper mills, and we work with other people on joint ventures, and and but but we just we finally decide that we go it alone, and we decide this is what we ought to be in, and then we hired consultants, and they made a. a, a performer for us and all that and we decided that's what we ought to go in uh, it was a big investment before that time yes we uh, we had pretty well our own capital we didn't borrow any money so that when we built that we did borrow the money and at, and at that time we borrowed it uh, that cost us money too cost us more now it's more reasonable because it was based on the uh, prime rate and uh, that's the first time that we've gone into a major operation with borrowed money. Otherwise, we're using our own capital. Mm -hmm. We've been very uh, conservative, and we haven't paid much uh, dividend uh, through the years, and, and we had uh, accumulated the money to do these other things. I would suppose a, a graduate of the Harvard Business School would be critical of uh, not leveraging your assets. Right, 
right? And we got some people here that are critical. Uh, this fellow you just met has uh, been with us 21 years. He's an uh, extraordinary uh, smart. Uh, he's one of 11 children. He uh, went to Georgia Tech and graduated as in uh, industrial management. Then he went to Georgia State and graduated as a C as a accounting and passed his CPA. Then when he got here, he went to uh, Valdosta State and got his master's in business management. And uh, he's uh, tried to improve himself, and of course, uh, that's what he's talking about all the time. That we ought to uh, we ought to go public on certain things. We ought to leverage things, and we ought to uh, get money from other ways. Because it worried me when things got toughy about a year ago, and uh, and we owed money because that uh, I, I'd owed money, but I'd had enough money to put aside somewhere else to pay it. I didn't have myself in a jam. But uh, uh, that's the way they won't talk. You're right about that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that's carried me pretty fast. Yeah. But that same person 15 years ago might have said, well, you should have gone over to Union Camp or the warehouse or St. Regis and cash in on your, your land. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. But you see this business is more than the bottom line. Well, that's right. It's a pleasure and it's a... Uh, and, and, uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely it's our life that's all sure. we know you know sure. Sure. if you you had all that money in the bank then what would you do well that's right We, uh, you know I've said that many times we'd ruin all these grandchildren if they are coming along if they have enough money and I'm afraid that when I die that they're going to want more and more money and uh, you, you, you can't you can't control things like that 